Good morning, ODY members. Thanks for joining me today. We're going to have a good conversation and do some learning on photobiomodulation. The topic of this course, throw some light on it, photobiomodulation therapy in optometric practice. I am Craig Thomas. I'm an optometrist. I practice in Dallas, Texas. Been in practice there, private practice for 38 consecutive years. I'm still rolling strong. Uh, I got to tell you guys before we get started, I had uh, knee replacement surgery uh, last week and <clears throat> uh, when they put the tube in my throat, when they put me under, they kind of scraped my vocal cords and my voice has been kind of raspy ever since. So please forgive me if I kind of hack and cough a little bit through the presentation. I'm going to try to minimize it, but I haven't quite recovered yet from the surgery. Uh, Adam wanted me to postpone this, but I've been waiting for months to do it, so we're going to do it whether I'm hacking or not, so we're, we're going to proceed. This is cool. This is going to be some good information. I promise I promise everybody's going to really get some valuable knowledge. Uh, we'll, we'll try to have some fun while we're talking, uh, so where it's not some boring two-hour lecture, <clears throat> and, and everybody will, will feel good when we're finished. So, again, we're going to talk about photobiomodulation therapy. <clears throat> That's a new thing for most of us. Uh, it, it, I, it's a new thing for me. Uh, I just got uh, into this technology uh, last year, back in August. I got my device the, the first time. Uh, I've done hundreds of patients, or treated hundreds of patients since then. Uh, very, very good results, probably 75, 80% success rate. Uh, nothing's perfect, but I'll take that most of the time. Uh, so let, let's, let's get going. Let's get going. Here we go. I am a paid consultant for Conan Medical. Uh, that will not affect the content of this presentation. Conan Medical does not provide any type of photobiomodulation devices or technology, so there's no conflict of interest. But you know, my duty is to inform you that I, I am a paid consultant for these guys, so I am. So let's get started. <clears throat> what photobiomodulation is, and that's a, that's a new term for all of us. Most of us did, did I, I can't imagine any of us, uh, went to optometry school and had some type of uh, photobiomodulation or, or photobiology class. But surprisingly, in a way, we know half of this stuff already. And by virtue of us being optometrists, we actually learned a lot about photobiology. Uh, and you see the, <clears throat> the bullets. I never really read slides out loud to anybody. Uh, everybody can read while I'm talking. But you see what, you know, photobiology is the discipline that studies the effects of light on living processes, the, the biological processes. Uh, so how does, how does light affect us? Uh, you know, remember, you know, remember our basic physics. I actually, <clears throat> I actually still had my high school, my high school senior uh, physics textbook. Uh, and I reviewed it again to a little bit about light and electromagnetic energy and stuff. And, you know, just simply uh, remember that light is energy. <clears throat> it's composed of photons. And, and remember, light has a wave-like behavior. You know, we all know this. We've learned this three or four times. But just as a quick refresher, uh, the, you know, the, the, the basics. And as we start talking about photobiology and, and how does this uh, impact us and how does it blend into our practice of optometry, uh, you know, just like it reminded me of a bunch of optic stuff when I was reading it, where you said the first law of photobiology states that photons of light must be absorbed by a molecule. That I, you know, so you see that last bullet. And I was like, man, it's like we're back in school. I mean, for me, it was back in school. I, I probably spent oh, 150 hours uh, reading articles cross-referencing stuff, you know, putting my own clinical experience into play uh, to create this presentation. I've been working on it for several months, and, and I'm really thinking it's pretty good. Uh, you know, I hope you guys really enjoy it as we get into it. So quick review on photobiology. And, and this is what I saw <clears throat> once I started, started looking into the photobiology thing. So there's areas of specialty in photobiology. And, and you see on the left-hand side the, these these various categories, photophysics and photochemistry and so on. And and then I, I you know I got down toward the bottom like vision, vision. That's us. I mean that's a bunch of optometrists. And I, you know you see the description, uh, the photoreception that results in the formation of an image. This did I all the talk, the rods and the cones. I'm like man, we spent months learning about this stuff in optometry school. They called it something else. They didn't call it photobiology, and they surely didn't say that it was a specialty area area of photobiology, but indeed it is when you look at this reference. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm not starting from scratch. You know, when I talk about light and the, and the things that light can do to our bodies, and, and we all know how light gets converted into electrical impulses in the retina and the, and the signal is sent to the brain. Well, that's a specialty area of photobiology. And the other ones we're going to talk about today is photomedicine. 
the field that is concerned with the detrimental effects and beneficial effects of non-ionizing radiation. And there's a couple of others in here that kind of have a little bit of, of stuff going on, but primarily we're going to be talking about uh, photomedicine, so a specialty area of photobiology. And, and again, you see by virtue of us being optometrists, we are already specialists in photobiology in one of the specialty areas. So all I'm doing is adding to my credential list when I when I take on this photobiomodulation. Um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just piling on because I already got half of it. So I'm going to get the other half right now. So what is photobiomodulation? <clears throat> photobiomodulation therapy, uh, and I, it, this is simple enough to read the slide. You know, it involves the use of red or near infrared light at low power, you know, high power is going to hurt you, low power densities to produce some kind of beneficial effect in the cells or the tissues. Uh, that's that's the, the what it is. And the goal of it is to improve cellular metabolism and to reduce tissue inflammation. That's worth saying again. The goals of photobiomodulation therapy <clears throat> are to improve cell metabolism. And we're going to talk about that. How does that work? You know, it's not just some kind of voodoo thing. And how does how does this light reduce tissue inflammation? Uh, those are the two primary goals of the therapy. And, and let's get into that. OK, on this slide, we're going to review some basic biomicrobiology. Uh, we've all been to microbiology class and, and we all know this stuff. Uh, some of it's even basic high school biology. But to move forward, we must review it. So here we have a, a regular cell in our body, you know, kind of a representation. We see the, the cell nucleus. Uh, you know, you've got all the organelles inside the cells, some vacuoles and centrioles. Uh, you see these structures here, the mitochondria. Uh, note how, how numerous these mitochondria are. Uh, and most cells have a whole bunch of it because that's where the energy for the cell comes from. So, so uh, you know, a picture of a cell right there. <clears throat> and you see on our left-hand side, uh, you know, what is cellular respiration. Really, it's a, a set of metabolic reactions. They, they take place within the mitochondria. It's a chemical reaction. And the, re, the result of the reaction is to produce adenosine triphosphate, what we call ATP. And that's the energy, of course, that powers cellular functions. You know, where the, it powers all the, the cells uh, the dividing, the removing waste products, all the physiological processes. That stuff takes energy. That just happened. And the, the, the primary source of the energy, the energy is is adenosine triphosphate, the ATP. I remember, and I got to tell y'all, when I was when I was researching the the, the 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 content for this presentation and having to go back and and review this particular part of it, and, and we got into the, the the reactions that produce ATP, the glycolysis, the pyruvate oxidation, Krebs cycle. When I saw Krebs cycle, I almost I almost fell out. I'm like, I didn't, can't believe that I'm actually having to go back and review Krebs cycle. I did not like that stuff when I took it the first time, and I didn't like it when I was reading it this time. But it made more sense as a grown man, uh, you know, with 38 years of clinical experience, it was pretty easy to review it. It all, it all came back. <clears throat> but I remember in the beginning, that stuff was really complicated and complex and hard to understand. I didn't like it. And I was like, man, this stuff is ridiculous. Uh, but you got to kind of know what it is uh, for this photobiomodulation to make sense. You've got to understand, uh, you know, these, you know, basic in a basic level, of course, you know, glycolysis and the, the oxidation and, and Krebs cycle. You've got to understand how ATP is produced because that's that's a, a variable in, in the in the cell's metabolism, and we're going to use photobiomodulation to improve uh, cellular metabolism. So you know we got to you know how do you, how does it do that? So it's going to start working on these mitochondria. So cellular structures, production of ATP, uh, cellular anatomy. That's what we got right here. So let's focus on the mitochondria. That's where, where that's where all the action is in this kind of stuff. So we've got a representation here of a of a regular <clears throat> mitochondria in a cell. There's there's different ways to represent the mitochondria. I just thought this was a really cool shot with the colors. It's it's not the way it really is. <clears throat> the way it really is, you'd have to do a, an electron photomicrograph to actually see all the different uh, uh, structures inside the mitochondria. But just you know, for for argument's sake, while we're talking, we'll just presume that this is a representation of a regular uh, normal mitochondria inside the cell. So what we're going to talk about a little bit is mitochondrial disease. 
And, and again, this is not something that optometrists usually talk to each other about. I, I can't remember the last article I read in optometry, uh, optometric management or review of optometry talking about mitochondrial disease. But as a healthcare professional, because I have patients that have had mitochondrial disease, you know, on, a, on occasion it does come up in, in the history. So, I mean, I have a, a passing awareness of it, but by no means am I some kind of a biochemistry uh, a fanatic where I know all about mitochondrial disease until now. Okay, now I do. So, so here, and you're going to know it too. So, the main thing that we need to know, as far as what we're talking about with the photobiomodulation, is that when mitochondria, when the cells get damaged, and, and the, if the cells are damaged, then the mitochondria inside the cells are going to get damaged. When they get damaged from aging or injury, some kind of trauma, the mitochondria produce nitric oxide. Uh, nitric oxide is a, a fairly well-known molecule. It's got lots of functions, some of them good, some of them bad. It usually depends on where the nitric oxide is and how much is it as to whether it's doing good stuff or bad stuff. So, you know, it's almost like everything else. It's, it's like, like laughing gas when I was at the dentist office, you know, and, and I fell out because I had too much gas and he came in and he says, hey man, sometimes you can get too much of a good thing. And so sometimes you can get too much nitric oxide and it'll mess you up. So, the, the, what you've got to understand as we go forward, you, again, you can see the bullets. You see the number two bullet. Why is the nitric oxide important in mitochondrial disease and in cellular respiration? Well, and I, you know, we're not going to go through all the, the nitty gritty of the diagrams here as far as the, the production of the ATP and all the Krebs cycle, all the diagrams that go with that. But suffice it to say, once you get into the, the, the reaction, there's a, a step one, two, three, and four. And once you get to, to unit four in this, this chain reaction, this cascade, uh, what's called the mitochondrial electron transport chain, what happens is that nitric oxide, if you can imagine nitric oxide is kind of kind of hanging off to the side, kind of just in the cytoplasm, and the, the metabolic reaction requires oxygen to, to continue the reaction. So imagine you've got this cascade going on. The cascade is part of cellular respiration, part of the production of AP, ATP. So it's almost like dominoes falling, where you push the first domino, then it, it knocks the second one down, it knocks the third one down, it knocks the fourth one down. And then you can have a thousand of them lined up and they'll all fall down in a row. If you pull two dominoes out of the sequence, and, the, and then it won't continue. So you can stop the reaction, you know, some kind of way. And that's how most drugs work, you know, where they just go inside and, and, and find a spot where they can insert themselves and stop a reaction. So in the normal cellular respiration, as you're going through steps one, two, three, four, oxygen is required in step, steps three and four. And what happens is that if there's too much nitric oxide within the cell, the nitric oxide displaces the oxygen molecule. It basically knocks it out the way and, t and takes its place. It's all that biochemistry, the bonding sites. So the, the, the nitric oxide will competitively displace the, the oxygen and, and lock onto the, the molecules inside the mitochondria and it stops the reaction. So, so when you have a displacement of oxygen, that's the term. So the nitric oxide comes in, takes over like a big bully, knocks the oxygen out the way, knocks them outside. And once that happens, you, it's called displacement of oxygen. So then you get all kind of bad stuff happening. You get an overproduction of reactive oxygen species, that ROS stuff that we've seen before. This leads to oxidative stress. Most of us are pretty familiar with that. Those of us that have uh, a real heavy emphasis in nutrition and, and holistic approaches to clinical care are really familiar with what oxidative stress and, and what it can do to the body and how it damages the cells. It does all kind of bad stuff. So again, to condense this slide down, mitochondrial disease occurs when there's too much nitric oxide. So the mitochondria, when they get, get kind of messed up, they start making too much nitric oxide. The nitric oxide displaces the oxygen. It messes up the, the reaction and the production of ATP stops. So you have a decrease in cellular metabolism. The cell is less healthy because it's not making enough energy to get the job done. The energy production goes down. So the, the consequence of, of malfunctioning mitochondria or mitochondrial disease is decreased energy production, which de facto is, is decreased cellular metabolism. So what are we going to do about it? Well, this is what we're going to do about it. We're going to fix it. 
We're going to make it better. We're going to zap that thing with some light energy. You see the, the, the representation I've got here where the, the red light, the red or the near infrared light is coming in. The energy is absorbed by the mitochondria. So you can see the, the change in color. I'm trying to reflect the, the absorption process. And, and you see the little tag at the bottom, photobiomodulation changes the mitochondria. So again, what's happening, you've got this, this, this nitric oxide that's now interrupted the production of ATP. And you guys can read the, the bullets while I'm talking. The, 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 the nitric oxide is, is stopping the reaction and the cell metabolism is going down. And <clears throat> what is theorized, and it is a theory, you know, that's not quite 100% proven, but all of the, the articles that I've read, and I've got probably 20 of them on, on this topic, they all say the same thing, and that the leading hypothesis of photobiomodulation therapy is that the photons that are coming in with the red and the near infrared light, like you see represented here, the photons disassociate the inhibitory nitric oxide from the cytochrome C oxidase that should be there in the first place. And so it's, it's almost the reverse of what we were just talking about. Once the, the red or the near infrared light comes in, it basically pushes the nitric oxide out the way because the nitric oxide bond is not very strong. And so it's pretty easy to break it. And so the, 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 the energy comes in and it, it starts the biochemical reaction. The reaction displaces the nitric oxide that's messing everything up and it allows the oxygen molecules that were kind of standing off to the side, they were just there waiting. So, so once they got displaced by the nitric oxide, they really didn't go far away. They just kind of went around the corner. So they're ready to come back. So as soon as the nitric oxide is out the way, as soon as the, as soon as the red light pushes the nitric oxide out the way, <clears throat> the oxygen molecules come right back in and the reaction starts up almost immediately. And so if you see the bullets there, uh, the inhibition of cellular respir respiration is fully reversible once the nitric oxide is removed. It's like flipping a switch. So if the mitochondria is not producing any AP ATP and the cellular metabolism is going down, within seconds uh, from exposure to this red light, uh, you flip the script. The oxygen comes right back in, the reaction starts right back up, and everything's like it's supposed to be. Uh, so the, the, the exposure uh, uh, to the tissue from this red light does this. This is the leading hypothesis. And you see that last bullet where I was talking about the, the, the nitric oxide is non-covalently bound to the, to the uh, hemoglobin and the copper centers, and it blocks this oxygen at a 10 to 1 ratio. So, so it doesn't take a whole lot of energy you know, one, one low energy photons to kick this nitric oxygen, this nitric oxide out the way, and it allows cellular respiration to take place again. That's what's going on. So that is the leading hypothesis of how photobiomodulation therapy works. The light essentially displaces the nitric oxide that's messing everything up, and it allows oxygen to come back in and get the reaction started. It's really kind of simple, you know, kind of. Uh, so that's what's going on in the mitochondria. Now, that is the primary absorption event, and that's what these things are called. So when the light is absorbed by the cells in the mitochondria, it's called an absorption event. So you got a primary absorption event, which is what we just talked about, and then you have secondary absorption events. There's a secondary thing, and there's actually tertiary stuff. Where, you know, you got, you got three levels of activity from one exposure to the light. So you see the, the you see this really kind of it's not that complicated. I got this chart off of you know everything's referenced. I, I got this uh, this chart from this article here talking about mechanisms and mitochondrial redox signaling and photobiomodulation. You know, it's as I read these articles now. You know, I'm 61 years old, and sometimes I just I just roll my eyes and look in the mirror. I'm like, man, this is crazy. I can't believe I'm reading articles on mechanism of mitochondrial signaling. I'm an optometrist. You know, what is this? This is not what I, this is not optometry. Oh, yes, it is now. Okay, so it is now. So here, here you got your mitochondria. So, so this is the representation of the mitochondria. The mitochondria is exposed to the light. It, all the, it, it, the excitation energy, that's what's called. So, so you got energy, it's energy based. The energy is absorbed by the mitochondria and you really get three different things. You get the nitric oxide displaced. You get the oxygen coming in. It does all this stuff where you get all these, these uh, inflammatory things going on, all these, these um, 
uh, you know, what do you call them, signaling pathways and transcription factors. You know, here's at the bottom where you get the ATP production. So, again, just going to the bullets, uh, secondary effects of the photon absorption. Okay, you get, you get all these benefits. You know, the ATP production goes up. The electron transport inside the mitochondria goes up. The nitric oxide that was bound inside the mitochondria where it shouldn't have been now is out kind of free floating and nitric oxide kind of dilates the blood vessel so it increases circulation and in a as long as it's controlled you can get a brief burst of reoxygen oxygen species which actually helps things and, and increases cellular metabolism but that can like we talked about earlier you can get too much oxygen and then you get oxidative stress so it's a very fine balance between having too much not enough or, or, or right in between so it, for most people you get these secondary effects once the photons are absorbed and this this second thing the tertiary effects this is really pretty cool uh, and it explains a lot of things that I was seeing clinically that I really could not explain I would I had patients I have patients I, I'm gonna show you in a little bit where we would treat them one time and they would get better I mean one 15 minute treatment with a with a red mask uh, and, and you know and, and two weeks later it's like it never happened like they're fine and I'm like how can you know that's pretty pretty almost impossible if you don't really know what's happening and I, I was seeing it but not understanding it until I, I got a hold of these articles and and this explains it so you get these tertiary effects of photon absorption and what that does again you see the bullets it activates these transcription factors and and signaling pathways it leads to this increased expression of of genes and that's what all these little biochemistry things are all these these uh, ex, the, uh, the the genes related to protein synthesis and cell proliferation and the cells migrate faster you get anti-inflammatory signaling anti-inflammatory signaling so it's all this biochemistry down at the molecular level man it's really kind of intense uh you got all the you know it's really intense uh but this this explains why uh, why on some patients not the majority but some patients you can get them better with one treatment session because of this because it's almost like you release the kraken you know the dam is broken you know once you once you activate these transcription factors then it, it begats this and it begats something else and and this leads to that all you got to do is get the ball rolling and it'll roll downhill but you got to get the ball rolling the the absorption of the energy from the red light the the excitation of the, uh, the of the energy gets the ball rolling that's what's happening so you get a, a primary effect like we just talked about inside the mitochondria where you get this nitric oxide displacement and allows the oxygen to come in and you get an immediate increase in ATP production it is immediate you get these secondary effects where you get uh, increases in circulation and, and the benefits of the a short burst of reaction to oxygen species that increases the metabolic rate too and then you get these kind Kind of downstream long-term effects these tertiary effects where you get into all of the anti-inflammatory parts of it so really kind of slick once you can see the science we're getting three different levels of benefit from one 15 minute exposure to the proper red light that's pretty cool so let's keep going so now we talked about the science so we spent 20 minutes talking about you know the science what is photobiomodulation cellular respiration mitochondria kind of the mitochondria in health the mitochondria in disease a little bit of biochemistry a little bit of immunology you know you know you got to have some skills to understand this you know this is not for the meek uh so so now we're going to get into it now we're going to go clinical we got the background we understand a little bit of science uh you know and you don't have to understand it all i've given you enough to where you know it's not just gibberish you know it's it's real so now let's talk about photobiomodulation therapy so what we want to do is we want to activate the cells we want to make them do stuff you want to get the ball rolling that's what you want to do you want to get the ball rolling so cellular activation can be achieved using light emitting diodes uh, the diodes have to be of a specific wavelength 
that's the, the the wavelength and the energy that's the deal so to achieve photo activation that's the term where you get the ball rolling so again I, you know we've all been exposed to red light i put up christmas lights every year they're red okay nothing happens to me it's, it's, it's not you know that it's not just any old red light okay it ain't like that uh it's not some red light you could get at amazon for 39.99 okay you're wasting 39 dollars if you do that it's got to be special okay and this 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 one is special so the, the way the light therapy is delivered or applied is with this application mask that you see on this photo. So this is a patient of mine. All these pictures you're getting ready to see, they're all my patients. They're all my pictures. We took them. Uh, none of this download to the internet stuff. This is, this is what it looks like. So this is one of my patients going through a photobiomodulation therapy session. This is what it looks like. Primarily, we use a red light mask. That is the workhorse for photobiomodulation modulation therapy. I could shorten it and say PBM therapy. Uh, you know, we've said photo, it's a long word. And, and I've, I'm still, I, had to, I, I, I have to tell you, uh, you know, I had my knee replacement, you know, last week. And I'm still taking some hydrocodone. And, and I'm, I'm not quite 100%. My mouth's pretty dry. I feel like I got cotton in there. That hydrocodone's messing with me. But we're two days away from the presentation, so we got to get going. So I'm just I'm going to kind of rough it through. So red light mask. This is the primary uh, tool to deliver the treatment to the patients. This is, this is the one that you're going to use most of the time. There's a red one, there's a blue one, there's a yellow one. So we're going to start with the red one. So what the red light mask does, as you see on the bullets, it, it, you get the, the improvement in cellular metabolism because the ATP production increases. You get the reduction of inflammation because it upregulates these antioxidant defenses. It reduces oxidative stress. We just talked about that. You get light-induced activation of the transcription factors and signaling pathways. Okay, we just talked about that. You know, a bunch of immunology, biochemistry. You know, it, it, it's complicated, but it's not. I mean, we're all doctors. And, and so when, when and these last things are kind of just for the, for the science and the physics of it, you know, just in case anybody wanted to know what I actually looked it up. You know, when you get a 15 minute treatment, you, the, the, you know, this whole vocabulary of, of light energy talk, you know, illuminance and fluence and all that kind of stuff. It's a bunch of vision science. We all took it. But for me, it was 40 years ago. Uh, so, so the total fluence in the treated area is 100 joules per centimeter square. Uh, you see the the emission powers. I just put that in it to be technical uh, to, to prove that, you know, hey, this is real stuff. But this is your red light mask. This is the, you know, out of, you know, I've had my technology for six, seven months. We've probably done 400 patients. You know, I use this mask 80% of the time. So this is your workhorse, okay? For those patients where the red light mask is not going to get the job done entirely, the, the second way to deliver this photobiomodulation modulation therapy is with a blue light mass. So different wavelength, different type of energy spectrum. So again, the, the, this was important enough to actually read the slide. I, I'll just start off. Blue light energy is absorbed by molecules called porphyrins within the bacteria and photosensitization occurs. So you have You've got the cells. We've already talked about cell structure, cell anatomy. You know, we're still into the cellular uh, uh, mechanisms here. Within the cells, you've got these molecules called porphyrins. It's kind of an aromatic shaped molecule. I, I looked it up and, and read. I actually read, you know, the, shockingly, I read three or four articles. There's actually quite a bit of, of, of literature on it, on porphyrins. And you know, I mean, I had never heard that word up until five, six months ago. I mean, I don't know anybody, any other optometrist that would have. Uh, but I, I, I'm a porphyrin expert now. I mean, again, I've read three or four articles on porphyrins. Uh, so these porphyrins are inside the, the cells, these molecules within the cells and on the surface of the cells. And in the process of, of uh, photobiomodulation therapy with the blue light, not the red, the blue light. So when the when the cells are exposed to the blue light, the porphyrins, which are chromophores, they absorb the blue light and they are sensitized. And the term is photosensitization. So that's the first step, uh, the first absorption event. So the blue light it, it hits the cells. These molecules called porphyrins absorb the energy from the blue light, uh, the, the uh, absorption event produces photosensitization. And the, in a general sense, the, the, the exposure to the light results in what's called photodynamic inactivation, which is a process in which we kill bacteria with light. So we can kill bacteria 
with certain kinds of lights. This particular blue light works like this. So when the when on blue light illumination, the, the porphyrins, which are usually on the, the surface, they're membrane bound. So they're 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 molecules on the, the membranes of the cells. They absorb the blue lights, the photosensitization occurs, and the absorption event produces a, a generation or a, a liberation of singlet oxygen radicals. So imagine you've got, you know, oxygen can be good, oxygen can kill you, you know, it just depends. Everything is, almost everything's like that. You can have too much of a good thing. So although we have to have oxygen to stay alive, uh, you know, too much oxygen or, or oxygen in a pure form or by itself uh, has the ability to, to produce oxidative stress and to damage stuff. So if you want to kill something, sometimes you just expose it to a whole bunch of oxygen, you know, and it'll, it'll, it'll start producing all kind of bad reactions and it'll kill stuff. So here, the, the bacteria, so let's say you've got a bacterial infection, uh, the bacteria have these porphyrins on the cell membrane, uh, the porphyrins absorb the blue light, the absorption event produces a release or a generation of these singlet oxygen radicals, so the energy, energy gets converted and produces a reaction where you get a release of these singlet oxygen radicals, and these radicals, the, this, the, what we, you know, the, the regular term is free radicals, so these radicals damage or disrupt the cell wall in most gram-positive bacteria, and it kills the cell, the, the bacteria. So if you got a bunch of gram-positive bacteria, uh, you know, on the eyelid, on the face, and the glands, wherever, you know, you, you've got, you've got an inf too many gram-positive bacteria where they're multiplying out of control, and we call that an infection. Well, if you want to kill them, well, traditionally, we would use antibiotics, a bunch of drugs, a bunch of chemicals. Okay, we all do that every day, all day. I know I do. But this is another way to do it, a non-pharmacologic way to kill bacteria using blue light. And the mechanism of action is that these porphyrin molecules on the cell membrane absorb the blue light. It, it produces a generation of singlet oxygen radicals, and those radicals damage the cell wall, and then, this, and then the bacterial cell dies. That's what's happening. And, and this is really, really effective because most bacteria cells do not have a strong defense mechanism to fight free radical uh, contamination. So, the, you know, they're, 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 they're vulnerable. Uh, bacterial cells do not like this, and they will die when they're exposed to these singlet oxygen radicals. So it's a really good way to kill bacteria. Uh, it, it, again, what's called photodynamic inactivation. I'm going to inactivate this bacteria with this light. That's how I'm going to kill them. So that's what the blue light does. So, you know, there's lots of applications for the blue light, and we'll get into it as we continue on. The third way that we can deliver photobiomodulation therapy is using the amber light mass. You could say yellow, but it's really amber if we're going to be technically correct. Uh, so, and I didn't get the amber light until I understood what I was doing. So I think I got my device in, in, in August or September. I figured out I needed the blue mask about three months in. I figured out I needed the, the amber mask about a month later, and now I have all three. And, and I must say, I use them all quite a bit now. I mean, I, I titrate care. I'm, I'm, I customize care. I'm going to have some patients where I do a red mask and a blue. I'm going to have some patients where I do a blue and a yellow. Uh, you know, I may have some patients where the, the, the red is too much energy, and I'll go with the amber to kind of tone it down and then blend the blue in. I've got some patients where we do the amber only. Uh, so, so, you know, there's no, there's no cookbook approach. Once you get some clinical experience, and hopefully with the with the head start of listening to this presentation, as opposed to having to learn it day by day and, and week by week like I did, and spend 150 hours trying to figure it out, uh, you know, hopefully everybody that's listening could spend two hours trying to figure it out, get you some technology, and start helping your patients. So, what does the amber light do? You guys see the bullets? Uh, the it has it's real similar to the red light. It's just not quite as powerful. Uh, you know, if you look on your on your electromagnetic spectrum is all the colors, you know, you go from the, the red to the yellow, the orange, and you know, the whole, you see the, the, you know, all the colors, you know, where red's on one end and blue and violet's on the other end. Well, you know, the yellow, the amber is kind of right next to the red, just a little bit, you know, less power. So I found that for me, if I have patients where I put the red mask on and they get a little bit of a tingle, it's a little bit too strong, then I'll switch them to the amber mask. Uh, the amber uh, has similar uh, uh, mechanisms of action. 
it, it works on the mitochondria just like the red mass to increase a ATP production. Uh, it, it promotes the release of the nitric oxide just like the red mass does. So you get you get the benefits in the neurotransmission, tissue repair, all of that that cellular migration and cell proliferation, all of that stuff, just like the red mass. Uh, the difference in the red and the yellow uh, is it, on, on the reducing the inflammatory response, especially if you have redness, uh, uh, patients with rosacea in particular, uh, the amber mask is, is really, really slick. It really has a, a good positive benefit. So, you, you know, people with those, those red splotches all over their cheeks and forehead and stuff, man, you can zap that away with this, this amber mask sometimes. And I've seen that. And uh, several friends of mine that have the technology, uh, you know, depending on the, the part of town you're in, the state you're in, the practice that you have, you know, if you got a bunch of rich people, you could do one thing. If you got a bunch of poor people on insurance, you could do a different thing. Uh, you know, this, this technology increases skin elasticity and it decreases the metalloproteinases activity. You know, it's almost like a little bit of a spa thing if you want to get rid of some wrinkles and get rid of some swelling. Now, that's not really what optometrists are supposed to be doing, but you know, if I'm there, I might do it. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I got to tell you, uh, you know, what I started seeing is I started seeing a bunch of my patients with puffy bags under their eyelids, you know, and, and I'm wondering, man, is that puffy eyelid thing messing with her blink rate? And, and is it messing with the, the closure of her eyelids? Maybe it's exacerbating the dry eye a little bit. Hey, let's see if we can get rid of some of that with this, this amber mask. And, and that might help your blepharitis and dry eye symptoms a little bit. And what I'm telling you is that it does. Okay. So the, the yellow mask I use when people can't, uh, I don't want to say tolerate, but when they, they, where they're not the best candidates for the stronger you know, therapy with the red light. Uh, so I'll go to the amber. But if I want to get rid of facial puffiness, uh, the, the, the amber light, it, it kind of, it, it works on the lymphatic system and it increases lymphatic drainage. Uh, so you get this, you get a clearing of the lymphatic system up in the facial area. You, know, you get this increase in stin, skin elasticity because you're, you're increasing hydration uh, of the skin. And again, you know, it's not really what, what we're doing as a primary thing. So I didn't want to get too deep into it, but you know, there's a lot of benefits to using this Amber mask and I promise you, you'll see it if you want to start doing it. And, and, and again, do you see my reference down here? Uh, the, all the references I found, you know, you look at this, the journal of aesthetic and reconstructive surgery. Okay. There's no, there's no review of optometry article talking about amber light mass therapy. It's not in primary care optometry news. It's none of that. I mean, I had to really look to find this stuff and it's, and it's in this field. Uh, so look at the title of this article that I got all this information out of photobiomodulation using amber led and infrared laser controlling pigmentation and flaccidity from skin. Hey, okay, I can do that. Look at the date, 2020. Okay, there ain't an article in here that's more than four or five years old. I can't stand going to presentations where I look at the reference and it's from 1988 or some nonsense. Okay, you know, everything I'm talking about is brand new. This technology is brand new, okay? It's, this is cutting edge, top of the line, hot off the presses, okay? That's what we're talking about. It's not perfect. There are occasional adverse events, okay? Nothing is perfect. Uh, I, have, I have seen everything on this slide is stuff that I've seen in, on my patients. Uh, so, so you do have potential adverse events from this therapy. Uh, you can have the, the, the eyelid and facial pain that requires cessation of therapy. So I've had, I can count them on one hand in seven months, the patients where we put the mask on and they say, Dr. Thomas, I don't like this. Take it off. Dr. Thomas, this thing's too hot. It's bothering me. Take it off. Dr. Thomas, I, I'm not comfortable. Take this thing off. Okay. I think maybe, maybe two people in seven months said that maybe three. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not there every day, but I mean, I can count them on one hand. Uh, so again, that's a, that's an adverse event ratio that I can live with. Uh, the, I, I've seen the, this temporary reddening of the skin, uh, following the therapy. Again, we're applying energy. I mean, you know, I'm not blowing on them, you know, kissing them on the cheek. I mean, we're, we're doing stuff, you know, and every once in a while, you know, you can just get too much of a good thing. Uh, so on occasion, uh, very, very infrequently, you'll have a temporary reddening of the skin following a therapy session. Uh, I've had, you know, maybe four or five people 
you know, they'll call up the next day and say, Dr. Thomas, my, my eyes are kind of irritated. My, you know, my eyelids are kind of tender. You know, did, did, did we do something wrong yesterday? You know, did that machine mess me up? You know, am I going to be okay? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Uh, and they're always fine. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I haven't had one single patient where within a day or two after that phone call, you know, they had to come in the office for me to mess with them. So, and so, you know, I don't schedule patient, patients on a one day follow up for this. Uh, but, you know, again, I say I can count on one hand the number of patients that that has happened to in seven months. So that's, a, again, a, a, an adverse event ratio I can live with. I've had two people where as we came at them with the mask, as we were getting ready to put the mask over their face, they spazzed out and got all crazy, you know, kind of like a claustrophobia thing. And, and like, hey, I, uh, what's going on here? What's going on? You know, what's, what's happening here? Like, Ms. Jones, stop. Ms. Jones, hey, stop, stop, stop. And we're just putting this mask on you. It's okay. Uh, we, we had one lady. We tried to do her twice. So we did it the first time, and she freaked out. And, and so we say, hey, okay, we'll call it a day. And so we'll just, hey, we'll, we'll pick it up next week. We'll do it again. And so she came in the next week, and her husband came with her that time. And and, uh, and I actually went in the room. Usually I'm not in the room when they're doing it. I mean, we're way past that. But because this lady, you know, she had kind of had that, that funky feeling the first time. I actually went in the room when they started. And we had to get this lady to hold her husband's hand while she was laying in the recliner. And, you know, we always had to, you know, form a circle and do a prayer prayer circle on her. I mean, it was kind of funny. And, uh, you know, she finally calmed down enough to where we could do it. And then we would have had did three treatments. But, you know, I think maybe two people had the claustrophobia thing. Uh, and again, that 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 small number of patients, you know, one to five percent will be photosensitive or uncomfortable to where they want to discontinue. So, you know, somebody says, hey, this thing's too hot. Take it off. OK, take it off. OK, fine. OK, go do something else. So you nothing's know, perfect. But, you know, I'd say out of my uh, uh, patient base, my clinical experience of hundreds of patients, you know, probably five to ten percent where you get no effect you know we'll do three four treatments and they just don't get better okay hey, it didn't work uh you get a real small percentage on the other side where we try to do it and they say hey i don't like this i don't want to do this again but you got like 85 percent maybe 90 percent where they they get better and i don't mean a little bit i mean a lot uh, again i could take those numbers any day so even though you have these 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 adverse events there the risk of them is is there the risk is so low, so infrequent, so mild, and there are no serious adverse events in the literature. There's, there's nothing major ever that's been reported by doing photobiomodulation therapy with these types of devices, with this mask. Not, not one thing that I could find, and I looked, and not one thing that I've seen in my patient base doing hundreds of patients. Uh, so, th I mean, I, this thing is safe, and it is effective. Uh, I have done, here's a picture of the, 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 the the cheek redness that this is what it would look like if you had the the, the adverse effect i've done two three-year-olds and a couple of five-year-olds uh where we were getting rid of shalazians and, and blephritis and i'm gonna show you some pictures you know i i did one of my staff's little kids so if you know we can if i could do a three-year-old kid okay this thing's pretty safe uh i'd say this is an example of the worst skin reddening that this is the worst i took a picture of it it was that bad this is the worst patient i've had in seven months as far as erythema after a treatment and this is her man this is her right after we took the mask off and so you see all the the, the redness right here the erythema that was not there before we applied the mask uh and she felt it she so i said do you feel okay she said no nah, it's a little tingly here it's a, it's a little funky i'm like okay fine uh so, so i we we keep steroid cream in the office that we use when we do our allergy skin testing. So I rubbed a little bit of the steroid cream on there. And I told her to call me if it didn't go in a day or two. She didn't call me, so I figured she was fine. Uh, once you had a reaction like this, since this was so quick, you know, right afterwards, I decided to discontinue therapy. If, if it was a severe presentation and I was running out of options, I would have let this heal up, maybe give it two weeks, and then I would have gone at her with the, the yellow mask or the amber mask and, and see what kind of benefit I could get there. Uh, this, she has blephritis, my bony gland dysfunction. That's what I was treating. So this is the worst that I've seen. And again, I have treated three-year-old kids with the mask. They think it's a toy. They love it. 
Um, that there no, I, the, the, I did have the one five-year-old, and I just think this kid was hyper. We had to almost papoose him down because he was a knucklehead. He was just bouncing all over the room. But the other young kids that I've treated, I mean, it's just it's like it's nothing to them. They're, they're not scared of it. It doesn't hurt. You see this little three-year-old girl here. She's like, oh, wow, I'm getting ready to put this mask on. You know, do I get to go to McDonald's when we're finished? I mean, you know, uh, there was no apprehension here at all. So if you can treat a little three-year-old kid like this, you can treat anybody. So the, the, the technology is safe and effective, and I have absolutely no qualms about recommending it to any patient for practically anything. Uh, there's a few things. I mean, I've had some people with the, the permanent eyeliner uh, tattoo stuff. I, I'm a little edgy on that. Uh, I've done one or two, and I was kind of kind of biting my tongue while I did it. But that's the only kind of thing I'm, I'm a little bit tiny concerned about. Other than that, I'll do this on anybody every day, all day, if they have problems that I think I could fix. So three-year-old kid doing it, anybody could do it. So now let's pivot. We've spent some time talking about you know, the background of science and photobiology, uh, talking about the areas of specialty that we participate in as optometrists. We talked about the, the science of, of cellular respiration and how the mitochondria are, are responsible for generating the ATP. Uh, we've talked about how when mitochondria get kind of damaged or aged or messed up, uh, they start making too much nitric oxide. The nitric oxide moves in and it basically pushes the oxygen out the way and it stops the reaction to make the ATP. We talked about how the, the red light comes in. The red light photo disassociates the inhibitory nitric oxide and allows the oxygen that's hanging off to the side to come back in and start the reaction back up. We talked about that. Okay, we, 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 we talked about the different kinds of, of light energy and the different mechanisms of action that they do to provide beneficial effects on the cells and the biological process. We talked about all of that. So now let's pivot again. Let's talk about our patients and what happens to our patients and why we would even be considering uh, applying photobiomodulation therapy to our patients. Well, the first thing and the biggest thing and the most important thing and the most common thing is my Bohmian gland dysfunction. I'm not going to read a bunch of slides to everybody on my Bohmian gland dysfunction because if you're a modern optometrist and even having enough interest to view this lecture, then you should have a very good working knowledge of all the ins and outs and ups and downs of my Bohmian gland dysfunction, the, the mechanisms of action, the pathophysiology, the epidemiology. We should have a reasonable awareness of that as optometrists practicing in 2021 unless you're living in the bat cave. So my Bohmian gland dysfunction is the first disease that we're going to talk about. So, so now we're going to close this thing out over the next hour talking about the various diseases that can be treated with this technology and how you do it. Okay, the protocols, my protocols. Uh, the, the, it's my protocols. It's not any kind of peer-reviewed uh, double stamp of approval, you know, from the AMA kind of stuff. This is Craig Thomas working with the technology for seven months, treating 400 patients, and I'm going to condense it down and, and give you the best shot I got at, at, at getting this technology and not having to take five, six, seven months to figure it out. So my bone gland dysfunction is the first thing we talk about. Hopefully, y'all been reading the slide while I've been talking. Here... A, a, a visualization of the meibomian glands in, in the lower lids. I, I must, you know, take a quick diversion. You must. I'm 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 almost begging my my colleagues. You must have my biography capability in your office to make the patients understand what's going on and what's happening. I would almost say if you don't have a mybographer get a mybographer before you would consider getting the photobiomodulation device because you've got to have a mybographer. You've got to be able to look at the glands like this, not some kind of bogus transilluminator stuff that we learned in optometry school 40 years ago where you pull the lid down and stick the, the butt end of the transilluminator on, our, on there and make everything glow red and, and you're supposed to see what's happening. Okay, that's like 1940s stuff. Okay, let's stop it. Uh, that is not how you examine the mybomian glands of a person in 2021. 
you must have a near infrared dual imaging mybographer. There's seven, eight, nine, ten of them on the market. I don't care which one you get. I got three of them out in my office. I'm getting ready to get a fourth. I'm going to have one in every exam room. It's that important. So this is the image. This is this is the this is this is the image. You got to be able to show your patients what the myobomian glands look like if you're going to get the patient to understand and accept your recommendations for photobiomodulation therapy. I mean, it just, it's just, it would just, I can't imagine how much harder it would be to do it if you did not have the ability to image the glands and show them like this. So, mybomian glands in real life, in real time. Here, a representation of what we just looked at. Uh, you know, a lot of you guys have heard me lecture on dry eye and my bony and gland stuff. Uh, you know, I've been on this for probably four years now, you know, where every CE wire lecture, I'm going to talk about some kind of ocular surface disease condition because that's what people have. And if you're going to talk about any kind of ocular surface disease condition, what we all know is that 80-85% of the time, the source of the problem is in the mybomian gland. So, you know, if you're going to fix somebody's irritated eyes, uh, you got to fix the mybomian glands 80-85% of the time. So here's a, a, you know, a schematic representation of a normal mybomian gland. Everybody's seen it. Uh, you know, everybody's seen the, the, the central duct going up there and the, the little acinar things that make the mybum. And, you know, just as a refresher, I don't want to get too deep into it. Everybody could read while I'm, while I'm talking. Uh, but this is a, a representation of a normal mybomian gland. So the mybum is secreted in these little bulbs, comes up out of the central duct, and then, then is, is out on the surface of the eye up here. So standard mybomian gland anatomy. Here, a real life picture, of course, of the eyelid. And, you know, if you don't have a mybographer, this is the best you can do. So, so you got these, you know, and, and I'm not going to belittle optometrists that don't have mybographers, but you should go get a mybographer. Until then, if you don't have one, then you got to go plan B. And plan B is, is okay. I mean, I went plan B for years, so it's not the end of the world. So, you know, if you've got to just kind of go with your slit lamp exam, this is what you're looking at here. Uh, you know, you're looking at all these bullets. Uh, you, you see the aspects of it, these non-fixed obstructions. This, you know, you can't really see that stuff on the slit lamp. These severe things here, you can see all this on the slit lamp, the, the eyelid margin hyperemia, the tarsal hyperemia, the telangiectasia. So this is what an eyelid would look like that would have mybomian gland dysfunction, you know, at a moderate level. Uh, you can see the, the orifices right here. You can see the glands. You know, there's a gland right there. There's a gland right there. There's a gland right here. Look at this dark space. Here are the glands of atrophy. Okay, so you see right there where it's kind of dark, so gland, 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 no gland. Man, but that would be like a thousand times easier to see on a mybography image. But we got to start somewhere, uh, so here it is. So still talking about mybomian gland dysfunction. And I, I put these slides up here, doctors, because as simple as it sounds, you know, some of us, you know, all of us, I mean, I ain't perfect. Uh, you know, everybody's got, you know, kind of things that happen. Sometimes it's staring you right in the face and you don't know what you're looking at. So you could, you know, if you were in a hurry, you got four patients waiting, uh, the, the person, your patient says, hey, doc, you know, when I wake up in the morning, my eyes are kind of burning, irritated. You know, is there anything wrong with me? And you, and you do your slip lamp exam and you don't have a mymographer and you go, hey, you look fine. You know, I've seen 10 times worse than this 100 times. But then if you kind of say, well, hey, well, where come this area is dark right there. Okay, that's 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 a significant finding. That that denotes my bomian gland atrophy, not my bomian gland dysfunction. That gland is gone, and that's severe, you know, advanced disease. So there's still valuable clinical information you can obtain from this biomicroscopy view, and so that's why I put the slide up here. We go back to really looking at it for real. Okay, so so back to my mybography. Uh, Again, I, I, I submit that this could look fairly normal, you know, with a slit lamp exam. Uh, this is one of my patients, the 30-year-old contact lens wearer. And so what are the risk factors for having this condition? Uh, you know, you see them listed, bacterial infection, contact lens wearer, allergic conjunctivitis, and so on. And, and I list bacterial infection at the top. You know, I kind of, for me, went down in descending order as far as the likelihood of the presentation. So to me, there's, you know, if you lined up 100 people with, with my bomian gland dysfunction, okay, the number one thing, you know, maybe 50 or 60 of the people, they're going to have bacterial infection as the primary cause of the, the, the gland uh, dysfunction. 
Contact Lenswear, okay? I mean, I've got 10 patients a day coming in with contacts. Contact Lenswear is a risk factor for my bone gland dysfunction, uh, primarily because of the mechanical trauma of pulling and yanking on your eyelids all day long, year after year. And the contact lens, uh, within minutes of putting it on, no matter what it is, a daily wear disposable, a, a, a monthly, it doesn't matter. Within minutes of putting the contact lens on, for practically every person, you start to have bacteria adhere to the surface. And if you sleep in the thing or wear it more than a few days, you'll start to get a biofilm develop on it. And the biofilm uh, exacerbates the, or, or it kind of serves as a precursor to getting the, the bacterial infection. So those two kind of things go together. And you see all the other stuff here. And the last one, advancing age, <clears throat> age is almost really, I should put age at the top. Uh, you know, as we get older, we lose meibomian glands, just like losing hair and losing strength and losing teeth and losing everything else. Uh, you lose meibomian glands as you get older. But look at this 30-year-old lady. You know, you got one messed up gland right there. See, when it's gray right here, there's no glands here. I mean, that's atrophy. So, so you have severe end-stage meibomian gland atrophy on this person where you got one gland on the lower lid that's getting ready to kind of fall out. And on the other eyelid, you know, you got three or four of them that are kind of halfway okay, but this is crazy. Okay, if, if you understand uh, meibomian gland anatomy and meibomian gland morphology and how to interpret these meibography images, this lady's in trouble. Uh, she's down to, you know, maybe 10% of her glands, 15% of her glands left, and she's only 30 years old. You know, what's, this, what's going to happen to this lady when she's, you know, 50 years old? It'll be like she got cornflakes in her eyes. You know, what if she wants to go get LASIK one day and they cut the nerves and her dry eye gets five times worse? I've seen people get suicidal with dry eye after LASIK. It's, it's incredible. You know, this is a big deal, y'all. And when we see patients like this before they kind of fall off the cliff and, and walk around like they got sand in their eyes all day, maybe we should try to help them. Maybe we should try to fix it. Maybe we should do something about it. You know, I don't think putting some Zydra on this lady two times a day is going to make a big difference. I don't think using Lodamax gel two times a day is going to really fix this. It's not going to make a difference. Cystain ain't going to help her. Okay, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to do nothing. You got to work on the glands and try to save the ones you got and make them a little healthier and, and prevent whatever and, and stop whatever's making them die or this lady will be suffering as a mature adult, I promise you. And 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 y'all know I'm telling the truth. Here again, another example of meibomian gland atrophy. Uh, you know, you see, you see the, the, the morphology of the glands. I'm hoping y'all can understand what you're looking at here. If you don't have a meibography, it's just, it's just like, you know, it's, it's like being on Mars. It doesn't make sense. What you're seeing here, and I used this slide on a previous presentation last year, so you may recognize it because it's, it's just so good. Uh, so this is one of my patients that has been wearing contacts 30, 40 years, uh, comes in, all of a sudden, hey, doc, I can't wear my contacts anymore. My eyes are just dry. I just, I just can't get through the day wearing my contacts. Okay, hey, let's, let's see what's going on. I, I, I image the glands on the lower lid. You see one reasonably normal looking gland right there. You see this gland, this one here. So this gland is clogged at the orifice and the bottom half of the gland is still working and producing mybum. The mybum is trying to come up through the central duct and come out the orifice, but it can't because the central duct is blocked. And so what happens is this gland is splitting apart down the middle, a process that we call unzipping. So this, this gland is being unzipped. And that's a precursor to it dying. Okay, it's getting ready to, it's ready to go. Uh, you can see this one here is going through the same uh, pathological process. These little things you see here, these are fragments of a gland. Or it's, it's kind of a, a segment. Uh, and, and you see how they're not clear, whereas these glands are clear. This is a, a phenomenon called fading gland. So it's not like the image isn't clear. It's not like you got to cock the ha patient's head to the side to get a better image. This is what they look like. And what they say, this is how we do it. You know, the, these glands, th that's this bullet here, fading or poorly defined glands. That's what these are here. Whole or partial gland dropout. That's what you're seeing here. Shortening of glands. That's right there. Atrophy of the acini, you can almost see one floating in the middle there where it's unzipped. Cystic dilation of the central duct, 
which produces increased intraductal pressure and the sign, not, not the sign, the symptom that the patient reports is, is tenderness to the eyelids on palpation. So a lot of times I'll push on my patient's eyelids and I'll go, hey, is that okay? Yeah, fine. Yeah, why are you doing that? And then the next patient, I'll push on their eyelids and I'll say, hey, stop, stop it. You bother me. Stop it. Okay, if they say stop it, you're bothering me. That's, a, that's an indication of increased intraductal pressure that's telling you the glands are blocked but they're not dead they're still working they're still producing mybum the mybum has nowhere to go basically you're blowing up a balloon till it pops and 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 you know but right before it pops it's got a lot of pressure on it and the patient will feel that as eyelid tenderness and so if you don't understand the clue of the patient saying their eyelids are tender, or if you don't understand the clue where the where you push on the lids and the and the patient kind of backs up off the off the chin rest, hey hey stop it, okay that's telling you three or four things without even having the ability to image the glands. So eyelid tenderness is it is an indication of increased introductor pressure, which means the glands are blocked and all of this stuff is going to start to happen unless you unclog the glands and fix it. Okay, so so it's it's real important stuff. Let's get to some patients. So we've talked about my bony gland dysfunction now. We did all the prep science to get to this point. Here's one of my patients, 56-year-old white guy coming in. He's been diagnosed with rosacea. He, he, he lives here in Dallas. He had been to a couple of other eye doctors. Uh, they had diagnosed him with, with, with my bony gland dysfunction, blepharitis, and rosacea. So he knew what was going on. Uh, he had a, a pocket full of drops. He had tried Zydra. Uh, they, he tried lid scrubs. He had a, he'd bought a brooder mask. You know, they were trying. But uh, he, I said, hey, man, you okay? He goes, nah, that's why I'm here. You know, I, I heard you. I heard you were pretty good. Uh, yeah, I want to get a third opinion. Okay, hey, I go, well, okay, let, let's have at it. So we're going to have at it. So he, that's how he presented. He presented with recent uh, examinations by other eye doctors. I didn't know if they were optometrists or ophthalmologists. Doesn't matter. Uh, he, he he received the correct diagnosis of rosacea uh, and, and the, the the ocular manifestations of that. And he wanted to to see if there was additional treatments or different treatments that would make him even better than he was. He did admit that he was better, but he clearly admitted that he wasn't as good as he wanted to be, and he still had symptoms. So I said, okay, let's get on it. Uh, you know, I looked at the guy with the slit lamp before I put him in the treatment room. So, so imagine that, you know, we're, we're starting off the visit. I look at him in the slit lamp, put some fluorescein in, see, see what his corneas look like, image the glands. I mean, there's four or five things that we did before we got him to this point where he's sitting in this chair. Uh, but, but we end up with him sitting in this chair and we're going to initiate photobiomodulation therapy to treat his rosacea and the ocular manifestations of it. So you start off with an external exam. And this is not the external exam that we learned in optometry school, which is basically doing a slit lamp exam. This is the external exam as it is proscribed and described in current procedural terminology, the CPT code book. Uh, the CPT code book is always the, the premier reference. It supersedes everything else uh, unless specifically stated in somebody's local coverage determination. So you always start uh, really with CPT when you're trying to figure out service components and descriptions and, and definitions of exams and the services that we provide. CPT is, is where that stuff goes, not some optometry school lecture from 40 years ago. So in, in this context, the external examination is a face-to-face -face inspection. It is not biomicroscopy. You get a close-up on the guy. In addition to the inspection, you should kind of, you know, you play doctor and you should kind of palpate around and look real close, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of touch him, touch his lids, do stuff to him. And so what you're wanting to do, you're wanting to feel the texture, the size, consistency of the, the head, the skin, the neck, all in through there. You know, it, you know I don't want to be politically incorrect, you know, but, you know, it's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm Governor Cuomo coming up to some uh, intern and I want to say hi. You know, I'm going to touch their face with two hands. You know, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to inspect them. So what you're looking for is any abnormal clinical signs, rashes, lesions, all of this stuff that's listed here. The, the, the erythema, the big nose, rhinophyme, all of this stuff. You're looking for any of this stuff here, face to face, no slit lamp, just me and you having a good time. Okay, so I've, I've examined the guy, I've inspected him, I've performed my external examination before I expose him to the treatment. 
here's the he's now being treated so we have the red mask on and there are no set protocols for this technology right now I don't think there will ever be because everybody is different uh, you know I don't want to say you're shooting from the, the you know the, the shooting from the hip or, or, or shooting from the seat of your pants but everybody's different and you can devise two or three different treatment protocols or, or, or paradigms and end up with the same end result that's what I've seen uh, so there's four there's more than one way to skin a cat so here's the first way you can skin a cat so I'm gonna show you three different ways to do the same thing so on, on this guy and, and again for me I feel pretty comfortable now where I've, I've done enough people I've seen enough results to where I can I'm getting pretty good at saying okay this I want to treat this person like this I'm gonna treat this person this way I'm gonna treat Miss Jones over there a slightly different way even though all three of them have my bony and gland dysfunction as their primary disease so hypothetical best practices number one so we would have an initial therapy session that's the terminology of photobiomodulation so I, I put the mask on we have a 15 minute exposure time get up and go home you come back a week later put the mask on you know and we get people to wash their face if you know if they got makeup or anything on most men we don't have to worry about it but you, you don't want any makeup or stuff on so you want to you want you know clean skin uh, second session comes back do the same thing again third time do the same thing again fourth time do the same thing again so this is four treatments an hour total exposure time spread out over a month and I promise you ladies and gentlemen I have seen patients get better by doing this and I mean a lot better I don't mean a little bit I mean a lot okay where I well what my standard thing would be come in a week come in a week come in a week okay we did four visits boom 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 I cut them loose for a month come back after a month for a fifth visit hey mr. Jones how you doing hey man do your eyes feel better oh yeah doc man it's like night and day I, I, I feel so good uh, do you think we need to do anything else or are you okay right now doc I feel I'm, I'm happy uh, you know if you're happy I'm happy hey I'm happy if you're happy uh, you know, we, you know we, we patting each other on the back right now and so at that level I cut them loose for four to six months uh, what I've seen and what I've read this stuff doesn't last forever nothing lasts forever uh, it can wear off it depends on the person you know I'm, I'm seven months in now I've seen some people where the effect is worn off and I've already had some people where we've gone through a second round of treatment most of my patients that I started treating in you know October November I haven't seen them since I mean they're fine uh, so what you've got one visit two visit three visit four visit five visit a month later so that's one way to treat my bony and gland dysfunction here would be a second way to treat another patient with my bony gland dysfunction so you can and, and this way this way is better I, you know in my experience and based on several articles this way is better than the first way so this way you do an initial therapy session photobiomodulation we've applied the red mask and immediately when the 15 minute session is over you perform my bomian gland expression the there's a, a heating effect and I'll show you in a second uh, where the where the the uh, the mask and it's not the primary mechanism it's almost just a side effect you know there's some heat generated from the light and and it is it produces a warm feeling I mean it, it's there I mean, you can tell you got something on your head so it actually is hot enough to soften the mybum and to facilitate the expression of the mybum immediately after the treatment so I've got two articles that clearly say if you do this and then immediately you can't wait you can't wait for it to cool down you got to do it really got to do it within five minutes you immediately express the glands and then you come back two days later and you do it again and then you come back two days after that and you do it again dr. stone cipher he's the, the doctor that developed this protocol he says this thing is the bomb he said if you do it like this man you could fix almost anybody now this is a fairly intense week's worth of work you know a patient's gonna be in your office you know probably what three hours you know in, in, a, in a in a one week time period but it fixes it I mean they're like a thousand times better you know after this third session so mask expression mass expression mass expression that works really 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 good well what if you don't want to do my bony gland expression 
uh, what if what if the patient can't come back every two days? I mean, they're traveling salesmen. They're here. They'll be back next week. Okay, so there's there's times where you can't do this, where you don't want to do this, where this might not work. Okay, then you go back to number one, or you can do it a different way. So here's best practices number three. Same patient, same meibomian gland dysfunction, but you can have a different approach so you can go at them like this if you want to go big dog you can hit them with some intense pulse light and we'll talk about that in a second you can put the photobiomodulation on them you see it happening you can whip out your blefx device and do a blepharo exfoliation procedure and, and clean the bacterial biofilm off the eyelid margin so you would start them off like that then two, and that's a lot. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of mechanical trauma on the lids. That skin is real delicate. It's thin. You know, this is max therapy to me. I mean, we're we're banging them now. I mean, I'm sledgehammering. <laughs> we're jackhammering them now. Uh, I mean, this this is strong. Okay, this is a strong approach. Extremely effective. <laughs> Extremely effective. So IPL mask, clean the lids, let them recover from that. Let the let the benefit of the intense pulse light that we haven't talked about yet come on in. Let let all those secondary and tertiary effects of the photobiomodulation let that come on in. Clean the eyelids. You know that we've already said. You know, 40, 50, 60 percent of the time, bacteria on the eyelid margins kind of kind of contributed to the problem. You got to get that stuff off of there if you want them to get better. So you you go first session like this. Let them have a couple of weeks to to recover and let the stuff go to work come back you hit them with the IPL again you put the mask on them again and now you express the glands see so now you've given them two weeks to let the let that congealed mybum kind of soften up kind of loosen up you're getting them ready to do this now you do all of this stuff this is a lot man they're in the office an hour I mean that you know this don't take but five six minutes you know 15 minutes here but you know, you or your staff or somebody got to squeeze those glands. Uh, so I mean, that's that's a lot of work. Uh, but again, extremely effective. And then you, you let them recover from that. Let it let it kind of simmer. Let it percolate a little bit. Let 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 you know talk amongst yourselves. Y'all got to let that work. And then you come back two weeks later for the third session. And you hit them again. You hit them with that IPL. You hit them with the mask. You squeeze them glands to get all that old mybum out. I promise you, if the patient can tolerate this level of intensity of work i mean it's 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 like a cure okay i mean you you have if this don't work there's really only one or two things left there's only if this don't work to me the only thing left to do is introductal probing of the glands with mask and probes and that's not what this lecture is about uh but i mean to me if i do it like this and and they they come back two minutes later and they say, Dr. Thomas, my eyes still bother me, man. They're still dry. I'm like, hey, man, you're 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 in trouble. Okay, you know, you go get your affairs in order. <laughs> you know, I can't fix it. Uh, so so there are three different ways. Three, there, I can go four. I can make up another one. I can go five. There's there's no rules. I'm giving you my best practices, and I have treated my several hundred patients this way, where I I I make it. I make up a not make up. I determine a treatment plan based on each individual's patient's presentation and clinical appearance okay i don't that so that so there's no rules make up your own rules or, or take your take my my lead and you can kind of go from there and and modify them as you desire once you get clinical experience let's talk for a second we're still on my bony gland dysfunction and this is a big deal. That's I, that's why I'm talking about it. So we have a, a topic called mybum lipidomics, and I, I've put this slide up on a couple of previous presentations. But I'm I'm feeling that once I talk about mybum lipidomics in this presentation, most of us are not going to be talking about lip, lip, mybum lipidomics, you know, in our offices or with our colleagues. So this is your this is your one chance now to get some information on mybum lipidomics. And and I I put this in here. Because there is still confusion, there is still misleading information. I don't want to say inaccurate. I don't want to say anybody trying to be purposefully inaccurate, talking to a bunch of optometrists and ophthalmologists trying to sell some technology. But there has been, in my opinion, uh, a little bit of a, an overreaction to some of these metrics where manufacturers try to take these numbers and twist them so to speak to make their technologies appear to be superior well i got all the technologies i got a lippy flow i got the tear care i got a myba flow i got ipl 
I got every mask that I can get. I got everything, okay? So I'm able to try every. That's why I'm lecturing, because I got everything. Uh, I can compare them, mix them and match them, uh, blend them together. Uh, it, it's really kind of fun. I, I'm having fun with it, actually, and pretty good money to be to, without saying that. Uh, so, so Mibum Lipidomics. So the first thing you got to recognize is that Mibum is not solid at low temperatures. So it never really gets, you know, I always tell my patients, you think about Mibum like butter. You know, butter can exist in different states of matter depending on the temperature. So if it's at room temperature, it's real soft. If you put it in the fridge, it gets pretty hard. If you put it in the freezer, it gets rock hard. You know, I can hurt somebody with a stick of butter You know, if I take it out the freezer. It's, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, I could put it on the stove in a pan and turn it into a liquid. It just depends on the temperature. So this, the, 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 the state of matter is temperature dependent. Mibum is like that, where the, 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 the state of the mibum is a function of temperature. So when the temperature is low, the mibum becomes more solid. And the correct term, when you read all this biochemistry stuff, is the mibum is at an ordered state versus disordered. It's, it's the biochemistry stuff where you got molecules on the chain sticking off the sides, you know, and, and the, the molecule doesn't change as far as its components, but the conformation of the molecule changes. It, the shape of the molecule can change and then change back almost like a chameleon. So the, 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 the molecules can be in various levels of orderedness, so to speak. So it can be ordered or disordered. Uh, you see the, the second bullet, Mibum never really turns into a liquid. Uh, so it's a, a liquid crystalline phase when it gets as hot as the person can stand it. So if I'm not burning you up, you know, I can get, uh, get, get it as hot as I can before the patient is uncomfortable, you know, where it would flow as easily as possible. The, 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 you increase the fluidity of it. We're changing the fluidity. Well, I can increase the fluidity to where it is at its maximum level, and that would be what's termed about 80% disordered. Melting. I, this is a personal uh, tidbit. I've read, you know, almost too many articles on my bony gland dysfunction and how to treat it, all the articles and all the journals that we read. And almost like some crazy man at the, at the movie theaters yelling at the screen and throwing stuff. If I see one more time some peer-reviewed, supposed to be nice, high-class scientific article using the term melting, to describe changes in mybum fluidity, I'm going to write the editor because that is not what is happening. We are not melting anything. Okay, melting is when you change a, 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 a product or a, a molecule. It's a phase change from solid to liquid. That is not what is happening when we increase the temperature of mybum. We are increasing the rate of disorder. We're changing the conformation of the molecule, but we are not. We are not changing it from a solid to a liquid. It is not changing in phase. So, so mybum never melts. It changes in fluidity, becoming more ordered or less ordered. That is the correct terminology based on these extremely current articles that I have listed down here. One of them in 2019, one of them in 2017. So this ain't me making up stuff. The, uh, you see the next bullet, the, the, the studies demonstrate the, is, I, I used, it says liquefied, but because I'm copying it out the article, but you know, that's not the right term. Uh, here's the stuff I was talking about earlier, the temperature. 40 degrees centigrade is required for maximum lipid disorder. So, you know, heating it up to 45 ain't gonna make a difference. <laughs> okay, you know, heating it to 50, it ain't gonna make it a difference. Uh, so if you wanna get it as disordered as possible, heat it to 40 degrees centigrade. Uh, you know, the studies that were put out by Lipiflow early on, eight, 10 years ago, uh, kind of mimicked by the tear care guys now because their stuff gets real hot. Uh, and that's what I use it for is when, it's, when, when, I, when I need the maximum heat or I have a patient where their eyes are so deep set or they're so goofy, I can't use my Lipiflow. That's what my tear care is for. So, you know, you could get it real hot, uh, you know, if the condition is severe. That's what all the reference article says. But the lippy flow guys, and I'm going to call them out by name, and I've told them, I said, hey, man, y'all are not right trying to suggest that it has to be heated to this temperature to do something. So clearly, the hotter you make it, the better. The hotter you make it, the easier it is to express the mybum. But you can get effective uh, uh, disordering of the mybum just by heating it 2.5 centigrees above, above the normal. So as long as you heat it up some 
and then express it, you're going to get some results. You don't have to get it smoking hot to get the job done. Uh, so you don't have to go buy a lippy flow, even though I did last year, because I, and I like it a lot. I use it all the time. Uh, I would recommend you go get a lippy flow. Uh, but, you know, but if you can or you don't, and, you know, I've got some patients don't want to pay for it. Okay, well, I, I got to do plan B, you know. So plan A is maybe hit them with that lippy flow. Uh, plan D, B would be hitting them with a MIBA flow. Plan C might be tear care and manual expression. I mean, there's no, there's no right or wrong everybody's different the main thing I want to show with this slide is that you don't have to get it smoking hot to facilitate the the the, the expression of the mybum and some of the manufacturers handouts and and some of the the journal articles suggest you got to get it smoking hot or you're just wasting your time that is not true here's what I'm talking about with the <clears throat> the the temperature change and this is after the mask so uh, when you put the red mask on, any of them, but the red mask is what you're going to be doing most of the time. So you put the red mask on. You do a 15-minute treatment. You see the, the as it goes down, pre-treatment, post-treatment. So you put the mask on. This is before the mask. Here's your range for most people, so 39.5 to 36.2. So it's a pretty narrow range when, when it's normal. Immediately after you take the mask off, it's pretty warm. I mean, you're almost, you know, 40.5, 41.8. That's the numbers we just talked about where you were approaching a level of maximum disorder. You're getting the mybum as soft and hot as you can. It, this, right now, it's as soft and as hot as it can be without hurting the patient. It starts to cool down fast. Two minutes, starting to cool down. Five minutes later, it's starting to cool way down. You know, we're not talking Fahrenheit. We're talking centigrade. Okay, it's a big deal. After five minutes... It's really cold, okay? So the, the moral to the story here is if you're going to have a treatment protocol that combines photobiomodulation therapy with meibomian gland expression, which is superior to photobiomodulation therapy alone, then you got to get at it quick. So if you're, if you're wasting time, if you're busy, the, the person had their mass therapy at, and they're finished at 115 and, and you got busy all of a sudden and you can't get them into the exam room till 130. Okay, you just lost your edge. You know, it's, it's almost like there's no benefit. You can still do it, but it'd be just like they walked in without any kind of benefit of the heat. So, so if you're going to do it and get the maximum benefit, you got to go at them within five minutes. That's why I use my, my MibaFlow technology where the staff can express the glands and I don't have to mess with it and trying to be moving them from one room to another because we do this in a special room and, and I'd have to get them out of this room and take them into one of the, the regular exam rooms. Man, that might take five minutes right there. And then I got to go in, wash my hands, get ready, do the thing, tell them what I'm going to do. It's almost impossible to do it properly within five minutes. I don't even try anymore. So we do it in the room with the MibaFlow technology almost always. And you know, I'd say 85, 90% of the time, that's how we do it. You know, when somebody's just out of control, I'll still go do it myself and grab some forceps and express them. But I try to see if we can get the job done without me having to do it. This is what I'm talking about, the meibomian gland expression. Uh, with the meibomian gland expressor forceps, uh, you, I don't want to really read these bullets. You know, y'all can see them. Uh, and it's just what I talked about. You know, if, if you're going to... To what the articles prove, what my clinical experience strongly suggests, to get the best effect of treating patients with meibomian gland expression, you must express the glands at the beginning of the treatment program. If you don't get this stuff out of the glands, this nasty looking cheesy stuff coming out of these glands, if you don't get that stuff out of there, you're almost wasting your time. You know, I, mean, I don't want to say you're wasting your time because we have we have evidence that we have strong evidence, multiple articles that photobiomodulation therapy as a monotherapy, as a standalone, this is all I'm going to do therapy, like I presented in option number one where the guy came in for four weeks at a time and I didn't do nothing else to him. They get better. They get a lot better. And it happens to a lot of them. This is even better than that. <laughs> okay, so you can choose how good do you want to make your patient? Do you want to make them kind of good? Do you want to make them good? Do you want to make them really good? Do you want to make them extra special good? I mean, you pick the level of goodness that you want to deliver depending on the patient. But to me, this, this second level of goodness where you're expressing the glands, I mean, I, I don't hardly do anybody now where we don't express the glands. It's just, it's just too important. 
Uh, to me, they're going to heal up faster. You get all this old, old kind of thickened congeal myobum out of the gland, and it allows the gland to basically reboot, kind of, kind of reset, uh, and it just, it's just better. Okay. Uh, let's say you do all of this stuff, you, all the, everything I'm talking about, and six months later, they're still not better. Okay. Then that means the glands are just stopped up or dead, and your last step is to go ahead and, and again do some probing and try to open the thing up with one of the masking probes because you've got some some periductal fibrosis in there just blocking the thing up and and none of this is going to matter in those patients but that's an exceptionally small group okay it, you know it's we're talking single digits as far as percentages so my bony gland expression simply i don't want to say has to be done should be done in most people which what we were just talking about my bony gland expression i'm using my lippy flow uh, I've been I've been thinking of getting the lippy flow for years. Uh, yeah, they you know to me it was just too expensive and and too much you know it was just too expensive. You know the machine was expensive, the coupling devices was expensive. I do not practice in an affluent part of town. It's a cash procedure. You know I just didn't see where I was going to have a lot of demand for something that was costing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, no matter what the benefit. Uh, and I chose not to make the investment up until last year. Uh, and again, and I decided, hey, you know, we got this pandemic going, our profession is changing, uh, you know, private equity, all the, the, the things at play. I said, I'm going to differentiate myself and I'm going to be a ocular surface disease specialist even more than I already am. I'm going to kick it up three notches, not one, not two. I'm kicking it up three notches. Just in 2020, lippy flow acquisition, tear care acquisition. IPL acquisition, photomyobodulation acquisition. I got all of this stuff in the past six months. I'm kicking it up three notches and moving forward. So here's one of my staff applying the, the lippy flow just to show you that I have it. It is the only FDA cleared device to, to actually restore my bony gland function. But, you know, I'm telling you, you can do it more than one way. You could do it this way. So you, this is when some of you may not be familiar with the Mybo Thermoflow device. Uh, this is this top image is an example of it. Uh, I've been doing this tech. I've used this technology for yeah, almost four years, three and a half years. Uh, really, really cool. Patients love it. They love it. I mean, it's like a crackhead, man. They love it. They just don't want to go nowhere. It's so soothing and massaging. The heat is just, you know, we do all this in a spa room. I've got a special spa room. Got the soft music going. We got dimmer lights. I got a little aromatherapy up in there. Uh, it's a it's a spa experience whenever possible, and the patients really like it. Uh, and I recommend strongly that you guys consider doing that. Uh, the iLux, I neglected to, to mention the iLux previously. The iLux is, is another device to do my bony gland expression. Uh, I know a couple of guys that have, and I know more than a couple, I, I probably know six, seven doctors that have it. Uh, most of them like it. Uh, it has the same negative as the lippy flow where it's expensive to use. Uh, that, you know, that I don't want to say that's a big deal because it's a clinical lecture not a practice management lecture but the higher stuff costs in my experience the less i can do it uh, so if, if i can do something where i don't have any cost uh, versus something where i've got a two or three hundred dollar cost and on some patients that's going to make a difference I, I, am i saying these things are equal they are not this ilux is better than this MibaFlow. Okay, do you want to pay, you know, how good do you want your patient to be? Do you want to be really good, kind of good, extra special good? You know, you can pick and choose. Y'all can, you and the patient decide how good you want to be. Uh, if the patient don't have a lot of money, hey, we might do this. If the patient's got a lot of money, we want to get it fixed fast, hey, I might do that. Okay, so it just depends. There's no rules. But you got to get the glands expressed. So for my best practices at treating my bony gland dysfunction, step one, you got to clean the eyelid. I think you got to clean the eyelid most of the time. So you do it with uh, the, the Blefex uh, electromechanical device. Uh, the technique is called blepharoexfoliation. Uh, if you don't want to mess with that, don't want to buy one, don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you know, whatever. P plan B would be mechanical debridement. Uh, you can do that with a spud or a spatula, just kind of scraping the lid mechanically. Just got to be careful you don't press down too hard and, and, and you'll cut them. Uh, you could do the home-based debridement procedures like the, the new lids. Uh, I've talked to a few doctors that really, really like that. I, I've not used it myself. I, I'm just kind of antsy about patients doing stuff at home real close to their, their eyeballs. And, you know, I've done it to myself. It's got kind of a little tingly feeling. Uh, they say that you can't damage the cornea. I kind of believe it. Uh, but yeah, I'm a doctor where, you know, without... Without sounding too funny, I want to control it. I don't want my patients doing stuff. I want to do it. That's my job. That's my job to clean your eyelids. That's on me. 
Let me handle that. You do this other stuff. I'm going to clean your eyelids, okay? So like the dentist, you know, you got to brush your teeth every day, but you're going to come in here every six months, and I'm going to clean your teeth. It's, it's not the same thing, okay? So I'm going to clean the eyelid once or twice a year, or you can brush your teeth and use lid scrubs and all that kind of stuff. I think cleaning is better. Uh, you can do both. There's no rules. But you got to get the eyelid margin clean because bacteria there are contributing to the problem. Step two, you got to apply some heat to, to liquefy the mybum, soften it up. Not melt it, you know, liquefy or soften it and evacuate the glands. You could do that with some kind of thermal pulsation system like the lippy flow. You can you can do it with the other stuff, a tear care, the myba flow. You can just grab some forceps. You can do brooder mask at home. This is what we learned in optometry school. <laughs> you know, I graduated I graduated from optometry school in 1983. Hey man, back then we were putting we were putting socks of, of rice in a microwave and then telling them to squeeze them with a Q-tip. We were giving them the outrageously bad recommendation. There came, there's nothing worse than telling your patient to go home and clean the edges of their eyelids with, with Johnson's baby shampoo. Uh, man, I, every time I hear that, I just start gagging. I still, I still see, you know, I, I do a lot of consulting. I go to doctor's offices. I'll see where they give out these handouts. Clean your eyelids with baby shampoo at night. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. The baby shampoo is going to disrupt the lipid layer of the tear film and tear it all up. These patients already got messed up tear films most of the time, and especially they got messed up lipid layers because that's where the, the lipids coming from the mybomia glands. 85% of the time, the problem is mybomia gland dysfunction. The, the lipid layer is already messed up. Then you put some baby shampoo in there, and it don't burn, so they don't even know it's in their eyes, and all it's doing is, is tearing up the lipid layer that's up in there. It just makes it worse. So all you end up with is a clean eyelid margin and no lipids. Uh, okay, that, that ain't going to help nobody. So, so don't use that Johnson's baby shampoo. Stop. It. Uh, the third thing, what we just talked about, photobiomodulation or IPL, and it has these benefits of improving cell metabolism, decreasing tissue inflammation, and of course, you still can blend in pharmaceutical therapy. I'm not saying don't use drops. I'm not saying don't use hyperchlorous acid. I'm not saying that at all. Well, this is a photobiomodulation lecture, okay? So I ain't got time for that right now, uh, but this is how you would do it, okay? My best practices. This is an example of cleaning the eyelid, like I just talked about. Uh, I use a, a Blefex device. Uh, I, I think that's the best way to do it. Uh, here's an example of the sponge, you know, cleaning the lid margin. Uh, if you don't want to spend several thousand dollars buying one of these bad boys, okay, drop 40 bucks on a spatula and just scrape it off, okay? Do something, you know, just put some alkane in there. Hey, Miss Jones, look up. <laughs> you know, then you pull that thing down and scrape it with the spatula, wipe it off on a Q-tip and go at them again. Okay, this is what I used to do. Okay, I, I got this BlefX device eh, five years ago. So what did I do for the other 30 years I've been practicing? Okay, I did it this. this so this works. This is better. Uh, these are the patients where you would want to consider doing an eyelid cleaning mechanically, an eyelid margin of cleaning. Uh, so, so you see the bullets there. Uh, here, uh, you know, this is a patient where we might go at them with some IPL. When you see the telangiectasia here on the lid margin, that's the clue where the IPL is going to be the bomb. The IPL fixes this like, like, it's like magic, okay? So you can have people with myobomian gland dysfunction. You see all this inflammation here? You know, you see this, this telangiectasia, these little squiggly blood vessels? Man, when I see that, hey, Mr. Jones, I got good news for you. Doc, my eyes are killing me. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to fix it. <laughs> okay, I'm getting ready to fix it. I promise you I'm going to fix it. And so on these people, you go IPL and photobiomodulation. <clears throat> and and the, the functionalities of the IPL, you get a thermal softening and liquefaction of the mybum, but it, it modulates the secretion of pleuro and, and anti-inflammatory molecules. It suppresses, suppresses the, the matrix metalloproteases, just like the, the yellow mass did, just like the red mass can do. So you get an anti-inflammatory effect. You get this thermolytic thing where it, it cauterizes the, these blood vessels with energy and it's, it clogs them up. So now they can't transmit the pleural inflammatory molecules and all them cytokines, all that stuff. It, you know, there's five, six things going on. It, it, it's complicated, uh, but it works. It works real good. Okay, so so now let's talk about some IPL just real fast. So, so here's a person still is talking about my bone gland dysfunction, but I want to go at them with a higher level of intensity. I'm going all out. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going to fix it right now. So this person's having IPL 
and gland expression. And, and this article here, uh, Dr. Arita was the main author. I've read a bunch of her articles. She's a, a physician in Japan. Uh, she is the Mabomian gland Yoda. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she, I mean I, you know, if, if you want some information on Mabomian glands, you just read anything by Dr. Arita and you just take it as gospel. If this lady says it's true, it's true, I, I go to the next topic, okay? So if I see anything with her name on it, I'm putting it in here. So she wrote this, this article, she and this other doc, uh, and they were talking about how to fix my bony gland dysfunction. And just like with the photobiomodulation, if you do IPL and my bony gland expression together on the same patient at the same time, they get a lot better real fast. So what she proved is that if you do IPL only, they feel better. They look better. If you do IPL combined with my bony gland expression, they are better, better function. That better function is not the same as better feeling or looking better. If you do these two, you get better function. It's different. Uh, I try to go like this when I can. So here you see one of my, what, what we call our eyelid hygienist. Uh, so we have an eyelid hygienist applying IPL therapy to this patient. Intense pulse light, you gotta protect them. You don't wanna burn up their eye with the light. Got the little goggles on. So again, to me, this is nasty. Okay, this is this is some nasty myboma gland dysfunction. This is ridiculous. Uh, you know, the, the edge is red. It's just it's terrible looking. I'm squeezing all this nasty looking stuff out of here. Okay, this is the protocol I'm going at with this lady. I hit her with the IPL. I hit her with the red light. I hit her with the blue light. That's a lot. Okay, I mean that's 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 a lot of energy being applied to this lady's eyelids and periorbital areas in one session okay leave her alone <laughs> you know leave her alone you know let it let that thing calm down let it work let it percolate for a while come back do the same thing in two weeks let it simmer let it work do your stuff come back for a third section do it all in two weeks after the second and third sessions you express the glands after the light therapy this is maximum, full-blown, all-out, I can't do nothing else to help you, Miss Jones, therapy. And it works really, really good. Okay, I'm telling you, if you want to go at them, hey, this is how you do it. You know, I'm, I, I'm going at you with both hands and two feet, you know, and we're going, to, we're going to fix it. So this is a combined light therapy protocol using IPL and photobiomodulation together. Combined light therapy, okay? As you see at the bottom, here's my disclaimer, okay? I didn't get this out in the article. This is me figuring it out. Uh, there's no evidence-based protocols, okay? This, I just take my word. You can modify it if you want. Let's pivot quickly. You know, we got about 15, 20 minutes left. Recalcitrant Shalazian. Chronic Shalazian. Shalazian that don't want to go away, <laughs> however you want to describe it. Shalazian that's getting on my nerves, okay? This is, this is... I, I've, you know, this is this is real. So this little girl came in. This is this is my my textbook prototype. If you don't believe it here, you know, this, you just walk away. So this little girl come in September. She's kind of quiet, kind of shy. But she's there with her mother and her father. Everybody's there. Uh, I go in the exam room. She has scheduled an appointment to see me, um, and and no special reason. She had no knowledge of who I was. She didn't come on a referral. She came out of desperation because she had seen two previous ophthalmologists and they wanted to strap her down, tie her up and stick her with a needle and cut it out. And the parents just wouldn't have none of it. They said, that is not going to be happening to my three-year-old girl. It will traumatize her for the rest of her life. And I mean, think about it. You're three years old. You might be old enough to remember getting tied down and papoosed up and jabbed with a harpoon and some guy coming at you with a knife. Okay. I, you know, you might remember that. Okay. I remember when I was five years old and fell on my face and knocked a tooth out. I remember it. So the parent says, we did not want to follow the recommendations of the ophthalmologist to have her eyelid cut open. We did not want to follow the recommendations of the eye ophthalmologist to get an injection into the lesion. So they said, we ain't doing none of that. Uh, is there anything that you can do for our little girl that does not involve tying her down or cutting her eyelid open? Okay. I said, absolutely. Man, you know, I was, I almost, y'all know how I am. Y'all, y'all listen to me a bunch of times now. You, you know, you know how I talk, you know how I practice. I'm telling you, this is a true story. So when the little girl comes in, I'd had my device for about a month and a half. This was the first Shalazian I had treated, but 
I had read a bunch of articles, well, the, the ones that are available, I don't say a bunch, but I'd read some articles on treating Shalazian, primarily by Dr. Stonecipher, Carl Stonecipher. And so I just looked at him. I said, you don't know how lucky you are. I can fix this like it ain't nothing. I said, I, 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 you, you don't know how lucky you are to come into my office. There's only, at the time, back in September, I think, I think it's different now, I think there were only two or three, uh, maybe four, uh, photobiomodulation devices in the city of Dallas, Texas, the 10th largest city in the country. Uh, I think I was the second or third optometrist. I mean, you know, maybe the first, I don't know. There ain't a bunch of us. So I said, you don't know how lucky you are, Ms. Jones. I can work on your little girl right now. So, and she had tried all the regular stuff. I mean, you know, they did, they didn't go at her, you know, trying to stick her with a needle the first time. And they did all the hot compresses, the digital massage. They put her on erythromycin syrup. They had her with the ointments. They put her on Tobradex drops. They did everything that any optometrist would do. None of it worked. None of it, not a bit of it. Didn't change a bit. Not one bit. Okay. They, so I said, I'm looking at this big knot on her eyelid. Y'all see it. You can see it right there. It's a monster. You know, I mean, that's like a little BB up under there. You can see a little crusting there. I said, how long has this thing been here? She said, a year. I said, ooh, I don't think it's going to go away tomorrow. <laughs> they said, yeah, we get kind of tired of looking at it, uh, you know, but we don't want to get it cut out. Yeah, I said, you know, I said, okay, hey, let's, you know, let's, let's have at it. We're going to go at it. So this is the pre-treatment appearance. There's the Shalazian right there. That thing has been there for one year, okay? Boom. We treated it the first day. She comes back for a second treatment. This is the appearance on the second treatment. So I've got a little text up here if you wanted some background information on it, what a Shalazian is. I don't really care right now. Y'all can read it. Uh, you know, that's what a Shalazian is. So for diseases like my bony gland dysfunction, Shalazian, Hordeolum, generally if you're going photobiomodulation only, light therapy only, four consecutive sessions. That's what I found for most patients. Sometimes you get lucky with one. This one took four. So this is her second therapy session. They're separated by two to three day intervals. You know, you got to kind of, this is not one where you let it sit and linger. This is one where you hammer at it real hard, real fast. So you, you, you go at her, do one session. Uh, she was a little bit antsy when we tried to put the mask on her. You know, she was a little scared. She's kind of a timid girl. Whereas the other picture I showed you, the other little three-year-old, she's like, hey, this is great. When do we start? You know, so she was like, hey, what are you doing? I don't know what you're doing. Hey, what are y'all doing over there? So we ended up having to have her daddy sit in the chair and she sat in her daddy's lap while we put the mask on her and that worked fine. Uh, so here she is, the second appearance. We did a third appearance. That is not necessary to show it. We did a fourth appearance. So this is her on the fourth treatment. Much smaller. It's getting smaller. You see, it's 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 there. We didn't do any try. She, I, I said, look, I just want to see what we could do by ourselves. We I didn't put I didn't put her on October decks. No no hot mask at homes. No nothing. I didn't do nothing to her but this. This is all we did. Okay. Actually, that that was the yeah that was the the last visit. Then I, I like my protocol is you do the treatment, whatever number of sessions you're going to do, and you cut them loose for a month and you leave them alone because you get you get you know you get downstream effects. The, the, all the signaling pathways, all, all that stuff is still going on days and days and weeks after the exposure to the light. So here this little girl is one month later. It's almost gone. It's gone. That bad boy is gone. <laughs> it's gone. The parents, the parents didn't know what to do. They said, Dr. Thomas, how come, how come the other doctors didn't tell us to do this? Ma'am, I can't answer that question. Uh, Dr. Thomas, how long is this going to last? Is this thing going to come back? Ma'am, I can't answer that question. Uh, it's gone right now. Uh, you got any other questions? <laughs> you know, and, and, I mean, we all, I'm like, man, I'm the best eye doctor in Dallas, Texas. I, I, I got my chest out right now. You can't tell me nothing. I, 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 my, my, my ego, I'm already pretty strong on the ego department. You can't tell me nothing right now. I'm the baddest eye doctor in town. I, I'm Leroy Brown, the baddest eye doctor, eye doctor around. I got rid of this little girl's Shalazian with no nothing but that red light. If Panzer's listening, he said the magic red light. Okay, this is the magic red light. It works, y'all. I'm showing you it works. I got rid of this girl's Shalazian in, in a month, and it has not come back. The last time I saw her was November. So here, photobiomodulation therapy to treat recalcitrant Shalazian. It demonstrates excellent results. I have not had one patient with a Shalazian did not have some resolution. 
what Dr. Stonecipher and this other doctor, Dr. Potvin, found out is that almost 40% of the eyes show resolution after one treatment. Now, that's combining it with Tobradex or something, but one treatment, 40% of the people get better. Uh, that's pretty strong. Over 90% of the people get better with two treatments. All cases of Shalazia resolved within two months. This guy in this article had 100% effectiveness. I would say I've had 100% effectiveness. I, I agree. I have not had any person with a Shalazian did not have complete resolution or resolution where they were satisfied and they say, hey, I'm cool with this. You know, if the thing went down 85% in size, if it went from five millimeters to, to one and a half millimeters, hey, I can live with it now. You know, we'll, we'll chill for a minute. There's nobody where it didn't help them. Nobody where you did get any, some resolution. Really powerful, really powerful. So treating Shalazians, to me, and I don't say this lightly, I, I present to you, my brothers and sisters, that we are approaching a level where it would be considered malpractice to try to treat a Shalazian in a young kid like this with an injection or with some kind of surgery. If, 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 the, if the ophthalmologist goes at this lady and tries to cut her eyelid open, or if some optometrist or ophthalmologist tries to give this lady an intralesional injection of steroids, this little girl, and they present that as the first and best treatment option, I would cons I would say that borders on malpractice. When you've got this photobiomodulation therapy available to you, which is non-invasive, zero risk, and almost 100% effective. All of those invasive treatments have significant risk, significant pain, significant follow-up, and do not guarantee resolution. There's simply no comparison. It's not even close. It's not even close. Let's pivot. Internal Cordiolum. This is the second category of, of diseases, conditions, uh, disorders that you treat with photobiomodulation therapy. This is one of my patients. She came in, uh, and this lady, this, this is a prime example. Uh, I, I saw her initially in September. Uh, it didn't seem like it was that big a deal, you know. And again, I, I don't even know what I was thinking at the time, but I, I put her on traditional conservative therapy, hot compresses. Uh, 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 combination antibiotic steroid drop, uh, digital massage, you know, standard kind of stuff. I, I gave her some oral antibiotics. I gave her some Keflex, uh, 500 milligrams twice a day for 10 days. I, my standard regimen. And it went away, kind of, sort of. You know, I saw her two or three times in September. Uh, you know, she says, okay, this is good enough. I'm fine. You know, I don't want to come back in here every week anymore. Uh, I'm like, fine, get out. You know, we're done. Uh, call me if you need me. Well, in November, she called me because she needed me. <laughs> so she came back, and the thing, it came back. And you can see a little bit of swelling right there, kind of the nodular appearance. You know, here's the lesion. It's not the best picture, but it's right there. So you got, you know, she came back after my first, what I thought successful <laughs> attempt at treating it through traditional conservative therapy was ineffective. So she's got this internal hordeolum, which is a, an acute bacterial infection inside the meibomian gland. As I just said, the previous treatment was ineffective at preventing this recurrence, although it did produce some resolution at the time. Uh, as we know, the, the hordeolums can be chronic, they can be intermittent, they can have exacerbations, they can erupt and go crazy, they can do whatever they want. So this lady it was coming back. This is that patient. Uh, and realize, you know, when I saw her in September, I didn't put it on there. I cleaned her lids. I scraped them. I did the, 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 the Blefex, bile, uh, Blepharo exfoliation. And she still had this greasy looking filmy lesion where the biofilm is forming right here on the eyelid margin. I'm like, man, that stuff is reformed already. I mean, it's just been two, three months, my Lord. So, so, you know, her eyelids were all kind of nasty looking on the margin again. So I, I went at it again. You know, I cleaned it off again. So, so bacterial biofilm, uh, this is this is the stuff that can happen with the bacterial biofilm. All of this, you get this overcolonization. This is the stuff we used to talk about uh, with Dr. Reinerson's theory. Here's the reference, Dr. Reinerson, Dr. Perry. They they developed this unification therapy th theory of dry eye and blepharitis essentially being one long disease, and and you're just looking at different aspects of the natural history of the presentation depending on where they are, uh, and that the the bacterial biofilm on the eyelid margin was responsible for the extreme vast majority of cases of meibomian gland dysfunction and blepharitis. I don't quite agree with that anymore. I did a few years ago, but my, my continued reading and learning and, and different clinical experiences have shown me that the bacterial biofilm on the eyelid margin, although a contributing factor to a 
significant percentage, if not the majority, of patients with, with myobomy gland dysfunction and these other ocular surface diseases, it's not 80%, it's not 90%, it's not 100%. You know, this the, the article here suggests that the percentage is very high and is approaching some kind of 100%. Okay, I, can't, I don't go with that anymore. But it is still real important, and I still try to clean these eyelids off most of the time. There's pictures of my bombing. This is that lady. <laughs> okay, <laughs> look where the horteolum is. Man, you can see that. Okay, so, you know, just I thought it was a cool shot where you can see where the horteolum is doing the mybography. So best practices on intortal hodiolum. Uh, I do not use IPL for these patients. I, I just I just don't. Uh, I do the photobiomodulation, uh, and then I, I I do all this stuff here. I go at them with both the red and the blue, three to four sessions, two week duration. Squeeze the glands if it's not hurting them too much. If it's tender, I don't do it. But this is my best practices for internal hodiolum. Uh, quickly, last couple of things. Uh, this little five-year-old kid, this is the kid I told you about where we had to kind of strap him down. He was going crazy in there. Uh, but, you know, the, you know, he's a kid. So this five-year-old kid comes in. You can see the staphylococcal blephritis on this right upper eyelid. You see here's the left lid looking normal. Here's the right lid all swollen up with kind of a protective ptosis coming on. you got a little bit of redness. You know, you got a light-skinned black kid, but you can still see it's red right there. There's no crusting. There's no other stuff. This is what he looked like. I put some fluorescein in. He looked fine. You know, just got his lids infected. You know, if you touch it, he says, don't touch it. You know, it hurts. You can see when I kind of expose the lid margin, you can see the pouting and plugging of the gland, which is pathognomonic for this condition. See right there. You know, there it is right there there you see the, the plug I thought that was a cool shot so so you know what's happening you know, okay you know kind of just low mag medium mag high mag another picture of it you know you see it's this close-up high mag on the lid a lot of edema red there's that pouting gland right there okay so what do I do for this young five-year-old kid that I really don't want to put on systemic antibiotics uh, every time you came at the kid with a bottle of eye drops, he'd start trying to kick in the, in the shin. Uh, so he wasn't having it. He wasn't, he wasn't having it. He, he said, don't touch me. Don't put no drops on me. Don't do nothing to me. Leave me alone. When can I go? Uh, I'm like, okay, uh, we'll figure this out. So, so I figured it out and I prescribed photobiomodulation therapy as the only treatment, monotherapy. Uh, so I devised a treatment plan for him, uh, four sessions, two weeks, 15 minutes on the red light. Because you've got a bacterial component here, almost always I would go at him with the red for 15 minutes and the blue for 15 minutes. But I'm, I told you five times, this kid was out of control. You know, I mean, he's just like, hey, I was almost like, hey, take this kid out of here. I'm, I'm, you know, he, he bothered me. But I, was, but I wanted to help him, and I wanted to see if this stuff would work on it. Uh, and, and, of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I did him four times, and he got better. Uh, and again, to me, I just don't use IPL on this stuff. It's on the eyelid. It's too close. I don't want to do IPL on kids. You know, I just this is a photobiomodulation thing. Uh, here, I actually posted up this case on, on OD Wire, this, this case of staphylococcal blephritis. Uh, so, so some of us may have seen this image before. Uh, but this one, I, I, this is another one where, you know, just when you see it, you just go ooh and ah. So this guy comes in with the swollen eyelid, the same kind of staphylococcal blephritis that the five-year-old kid had. Uh, he had a one-day duration, so like three days earlier, he's fine. You know, the, the day before yesterday, he wakes up and his eyelid's going crazy. Uh, it, it's tender. Uh, this is the third time in about 15 months that this patient has presented to me with this condition. Uh, I've put pictures on it before of him having, uh, this is this is ulcerative blephritis caused by staphylococcus. Uh, again, I've, I've put pictures up in there of me lancing the lesion when it has full of pus. So this is the third time I'm seeing this guy for the same problem. So it's just like the slide we had before. This tends to recur. Okay, you know, it's not magic. You can't fix it, but I could treat it. So he comes back and I had to put this guy on a two-week course of augmentin to get it under control last time. I mean, I had to really go at it. This is a picture of him, eight, just like I said, eight months earlier. So this is the same guy. And here you had the ulcerative card. You know, I, I popped it with a needle, squeezed all that stuff up out of there, put him on a bunch of antibiotics. And he was fine for eight months, but then it came right back. Okay. So now I'm going at him. IPL. So, so now to me, this is, I'm going, this is an adult, grown man, third, attack okay what i'm doing is not working okay i'm tired of playing with it i'm tired of messing with it i'm going all in two hands and both feet ipl boom 
red mass to kill the bacteria boom red mass try to get some energy in there try to reduce the inflammation no drops this guy comes back for his follow-up he was healed I don't have the picture that one treatment session of all-out therapy fixed his problem one session one treatment fixed his problem it was incredible and that was in November I haven't seen him since as far as you know seeing him for that problem all right here's our last thing we'll close it out a lot of people got Demodex got that Demodex blepharitis so we know everybody knows about it I'm not gonna give a Demodex lecture <laughs> but but this is the last condition where I am now routinely treating patients with photobiomodulation therapy uh, so we got an image of the patient with the Demodex uh, you see the, the deposits on the base of the lashes that are pathognomonic for this condition. Uh, you know, you can, it, can, it can be causing all sorts of problems. You see the problems listed here. So this is a real common, very important condition, real hard to get rid of. Uh, standard treatment now is tea tree oil. I don't know about y'all, but that stuff is like putting Lysol on my hands. I mean, I can't stand it. Uh, you know, I, I used to use them Cleardex wipes and stuff, and I'd be warning the patient, hey, you better hold your nose. This stuff's pungent. You know, but it's going to kill the mites. So, yeah, it's killing me. I mean, I can't, I can't deal with it. Uh, every time I used it and, and tried to, to wipe a patient's lids, I'd have to wash my hands four times to get that stuff off my fingertips. Or, uh, I'd put a contact lens on somebody to have some tea tree oil on it. So the tea tree oil is effective, but I don't want to do that no more. I ain't going to do that no more. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the, the, the photobiomodulation. So, again, just a, a slide of, 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 you know, the condition of the, the, the blepharitis uh, caused by Demodex. You guys can read this later. You know, it's getting late, uh, you know, but that's what it looks like. So, again, you got to we have to recognize what we're looking at. You can't look at this patient and say, hey, you're OK. You know, if this lady comes in and say, doc, my eyes are bothering me. Is there anything wrong with me? You can't look at her and say, nah, there's nothing wrong with you. Use some artificial tears. You'll be all right. You can't do that. You got to recognize the clinical signs of, of our different diseases. And these are the clinical signs of the blepharitis that's caused by Demodex. So what are you going to do? You're going to treat the Demodex with IPL, uh, the, the treatment options is, you know, you got to reduce the number of the mites. You're not going to really eradicate them. You can use the scrubs with the tea tree oil and you can do this and you can do that. You can, you can still try to do what people did 45 years ago and recommend baby shampoo. Uh, what, what the, the studies, this study here, this, this study from 2018, uh, this study proved that baby shampoo means nothing to the Demodex mite. They drink that stuff like Kool-Aid. It don't mean nothing to them. It ain't killing none of them. Say, baby shampoo, can I have seconds, please? Uh, and, and, and all it's going to do is tear up the lipid layer of the tear film. Uh, <laughs> check this out. Survival time of Demodex in 50% in baby, baby shampoo, 150 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they, they strong, so you ain't killing them. Uh, they're resistant to antiseptic, alcohol. 75% I put an alcohol pad on your eyelid and that's not going to kill them. It'll make you go crazy, but it's not going to kill the mites. 10% iodine, erythromycin won't kill them. Man, these bad boys are pretty strong. So studies show no significant, no single treatment will eradicate the infestation after four weeks of traditional therapy. So this is what I do. And this works. Combination light therapy produces excellent results for patients with demodesosis, which is demodex blepharitis. You, have, you go full, full bore, IPL, four sessions, two to three weeks apart. You got demodex in the top lid. You got demodex in the bottom lid. So IPL, photobiomodulation, four sessions, red light, blue light, blepharo exfoliation after the second and fourth sessions because you're killing the mites you know the, the lifespan is 21 days so you're killing them and they're kind of creeping up and dying as they come about the eyelash follicles and you got to scrape all of those dead mites off the eyelid margin get all that crud out of there for them to get the best recovery so i mean this is full bore fixing it as best it can be fixed i'm doing it i'm not sending a patient home with a box of lid wipes with tea tree oil and, and doing this. I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to do it properly. I'm going to do it with technology. I'm going to do it to where it lasts and where it works. That's what these guys said here in 2019. That's what they said. It's not really me. I copied their stuff from this article right here. Okay. It's not me making it up. This is the way to do it. That's what these guys said. This is my recommendation. This is how we should do it, y'all. So conclusion, Photobiomodulation therapy and intense pulse light application show great potential in treating basically any type of inflammatory eyelid disease. And we know eyelid inflammatory disease 
causes 80 to 85 percent of ocular surface disease. Uh, I mean, if you just start here, you're going to fix the patients 80, 85 percent of the time. I'll do this for six months. If it don't work, then I'll start. I'll, I'll reevaluate, start over, and and see what else could be happening. But if you just start here and, and, and think that hey, it's the meibomian glands. That's where the problem is. Okay, 85 percent of the time, we're gonna we're gonna make them better. So these energy-based therapies, energy-based. We're optometrists providing energy-based therapy to help our patients improve cell metabolism, reduce inflammation, kill bacteria. Man, it's, it, this is the way to go, y'all. So PBM and IPL therapy, you can use them as standalone. You can combine them together. You can use them with drops. You can use them with scrubs. You can use them with hypochlorous acid. You can do whatever you want. There's no rules. You can do whatever you want, whatever you need to do for that particular patient. And everything I've seen, everything I've done, everything I've read says your patient is going to get better if you apply this energy-based therapy to them. So I strongly recommend, I strongly urge that Everybody listening, consider getting into this type of therapy, acquire some, the, the, the terminology is a, a biostimulation device. Uh, right now, Marco is the only company that sells them. Uh, get you a biostimulation device from Marco and turn yourself into a photomedicine specialist like I am and provide photobiomodulation therapy and intense pulse light therapy to your patients and fix them without drugs, fix them without cutting on them, fix them easy, fixing them without complication, fixing them most of the time. It works, it works, it works. So I appreciate y'all listening. Uh, as usual, I kind of talk hard and fast because it's a lot of information. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'll be hanging around, of course, to answer any questions. Uh, move forward, y'all. Move forward. Let's get it fixed, okay? I'll talk to y'all next time. Thank you.